So I'm Amy Kutajim, I'm at the School of Social Work here, and I want to uh, welcome you here to the presentation. I just want to do a real quick um, introduction uh, of, of this. It's a speaker series that's um, on evidence-based practice interventions and trying to help uh, folks who are going to be working directly with clients, either doing interventions or maybe doing referrals uh, around evidence-based interventions to get more information about what's out there, what's good for whom, what, um, what referral would be appropriate for whom in what situations. Today we have um, Dr. Kevin King coming to talk about motivation interview. And it's great to see you great for now here. Um, this speaker series is uh, it's a monthly series on Thursdays. And uh, it's a, it's a, a co-sponsored event uh, by the School of Social Work and also the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy. So it's an interdisciplinary effort that we've been um, working on for the past couple of years. And we're really glad to have the speaker uh, here today. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about Dr. Kevin King who's an assistant professor uh, in child clinical psychology here at UW. Uh, he's a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network with expertise in the treatment of adolescents uh, and children. And his research interests center on the etiology of substance use during adolescence, specifically looking at how some individual differences, like the degree of impulsiveness, uh, might interact with uh, inter environmental context um, and their personal factors to increase the risk of cross-development. He's been co-investigator on a number of federal uh, research grants, also looking at substance use in youth. And is the author of a lot of peer-reviewed publications in a lot of journals, a couple of them, uh, Journal of Abnormal Psychology, Addictions, Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, um, Journal of Clinical Child and Adolescent Psychology, and Prevention Science. Without further ado, I'm going to do that again. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk about how to motivate people without having to be obnoxious to your audience. So, so I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm going to talk about MI. Uh, you'll hear me. So motivational interviewing abbreviated to MI because really motivational interviewing is kind of a mouthful. Um, and I, I'm going to try in the next 40 minutes, if I can keep it to 40 minutes, try to keep it to 40 minutes. I'm going to try to um, give you some of the research background for motivational interviewing, some sense about what it feels like and uh, sort of how it works. And then I, I'd like to try to send you away with just a little bit of a taste about what are the things that go into good MI practice. Um, and hopefully you'll hear a lot of my cautions about how hard it actually is to appropriately learn and do MI. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the research about how bad we are at teaching people. <laughs> um, which is a good thing. So like I said, I'm gonna try to give you some sense about whether MI works. Um, and I'll sort of talk about for whom. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong impression, but there hasn't been a lot of findings yet that it doesn't work for specific populations. But I think we can try to engage in a good discussion about, if we're talking about children and adolescents, sort of what problems might be appropriate, what age might be too young to directly engage in MI with children. Um, I'll try to give you a little bit of theoretical underpinning about how it works, and then also give you a lot of flavor about what motivational interviewing is like. So let's so start with an exercise about what is actually most effective in producing behavior change. So I want you to actually close your eyes for a minute um, and uh, hold up your right hand. I love, I love giving talks because I can make people do things that don't have anything to do with anything. Keep your eyes closed. You can put your hand down. Um, that was just a joke. You, but I do want you here's what I mean. So keep your eyes closed and think about something you're thinking about changing in your life. It could be something you think you should change, you feel like you need to change. Um, it, it's something, it, it could be something that, you know, you kind of maybe want to change, but probably you really don't, but you, you know. Think about something like that. Okay, now open your eyes, and I'm gonna ask for a volunteer who would be willing to share an appropriate thing that they're thinking about changing, but haven't changed yet. So it, it's not thinking about changing it for like, well, I was thinking about, you know, starting to exercise more, I'm going to the gym three times a week. That's different. So is any, I'd like one volunteer be brave and willing to share. Yeah, so could you stand up and come in the front of the room, please? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> She's actually been working on her public speaking, so this is some exposure therapy for her. What's your name? Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Nice to meet you. I'm Kevin. Hi. All right, so would you be willing to share with the group what you think about changing? Sleep. I need more sleep. Okay, so you need more sleep. You're not getting enough sleep right now. Right. Okay, I'm going to send you out of the room for about three minutes. Okay? And we are going to talk about you in very nice ways. Um, so her problem is sleep. Do you want to give us just a little bit of detail about sleep? What, what exactly are you looking to change about sleep? Like well, what's not working now? Or what, what are you doing now that you would like to change? Um, I have a 17 month old son. And I, he wakes up a lot okay. in the same room. 
to work him out of her. Okay, so so it's really actually about abandoning your child. <laughs> And the impact of sleep, right? So you're still waking up a lot. This is why he's still in the bed. <laughs> this is right. So, so it's so you would like to get more sleep, and you want to figure out because your son keeps waking up. And yes. so, okay, all right, excellent. So if you could step out three minutes, um, I think we're going to be able to help you here. So, so everybody got a sense about what she's looking to change, right? The situation's not getting enough sleep. Son's in the room, keeps waking up, and there's got to be some solution. All right, I'm going to brainstorm. So what are the different things? But that's okay. We can, somebody just remember it. So what are the things she can do to change this? What are some solutions? Just call them out. Earplugs. Okay, earplugs. What else? Hire a nanny. Hire a nanny. What else could she do? Okay, move the baby out of the room. What else could she do? Take naps. Okay, take naps, like in the middle of the day or something. Right. What else could she do? Accept that someday that child will not Ah, so she can practice acceptance and maybe commit to that. Um, what else? <laughs> Someday. Right, so she can practice patience. What else can we think of? Take yeah. sleeping pills. Oh, take sleeping pills. Great. Drugs are always a great solution. <laughs> uh, get her partner to do a workout system. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, like, tell her partner, partner to pick up some slack. Um, what else? Give me one more solution. Maybe making a. Pardon me? Go to bed earlier. Go to bed earlier, right. Okay, so cool. So we got eight solutions with something like 50 people in here. Great. Okay, let's take this back in and see how we're doing. Okay, so let's go over what we've come up with for Rachel. And Rachel, I'm just, what I want to try is, so we, the group has brainstormed solutions for you. And so I want you to, I want to, I'm going to propose the solutions for you, and hopefully people will help me remember what you all said, um, sort of like in one ear. Um, we have eight solutions for you, and I want to sort of hear your responses to these different solutions, okay? okay. So the first one was to drive yourself. Try sleeping pills. Have you thought about sleeping pills? Yeah, but no. Why? Why not? Have you thought about it, but? I fantasize about it, but no. <laughs> okay, I don't do drugs. Okay, you don't do drugs. Um, okay. Um, right, she, and so probably no drugs for your son either. Right, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys didn't think of that, but. Um, all right, so uh, what about just moving your baby out of the room? Well, we're in a one-bedroom apartment right now, so that's Okay, so the balcony is kind of cold this time of year. <laughs> right, okay. Um, uh, what we were have bought a couch with a sleeper, and so my husband and I are in the idea of moving into the living room. Okay, wow, so you guys can move. Okay, and you, well, your husband, that was one of the ideas, get your husband to pick up more slack. He does. He does already, okay, so you're already trying that, and it's still... He's uh, teething, I don't know if anyone here has kids, so, if, you know, he's wakes up a lot of teeth. I'm sure we could come up with more than eight students competing too, right? <laughs> um, what were some of the other, uh, go to, uh, take a nap in the middle of the day. Nap? I don't, how do you do that at grad school, take naps? <laughs> what are classes for? That's a good one. Okay. But I get all my homework done once he goes to sleep. Uh, okay, so so you have to sort of wait until he goes to sleep so you can actually do it. But what were some of the Ear other plugs. ones we came up with? Earplugs. Ear, oh, earplugs. I, earplugs. I wear them. <laughs> wow. Okay, I think that's that's close to all of them. Acceptance. Oh, acceptance. Yeah. How about you just um? I want to say suck it up. How about you just, um, how about you just like practice mindful acceptance? I will try that. You can actually practice right now. You can practice being mindful and yell in your ear. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Rachel. We have a round of I want to. Um, uh, I have some. That's what we. That's what we just did. Um, so I, I, we have 50 or more people in this room. I have many PhDs, many doctoral students. I noticed at least a few of my undergrads here. Um, we have people from. I mean, this is a transdisciplinary room, of, and some of at least some of you here are experts in child development, and you can't come up with more than eight solutions that are actually going to help Rachel and. She, and you're also not going to come up with solutions that she hasn't tried before. Right. So this is a this is a group exercise about what happens in many healthcare and mental health care settings. Patients come to us with a problem. We say, "Oh, I got the perfect solution for you." And then they these incalcitrant people sit and argue with us <laughs> about why our solutions aren't going to work. What is wrong with these patients? Okay. So. Um, you can vote if you want. I think you're already sort of getting a sense of what the right answer is here. But if you want, raise your hand. 
um, about what is most effective in producing behavior change. Is it giving someone reasons to change? Is it listening to someone's thoughts about changing? Is it teaching someone ways to change? Is it providing some consequence for not changing? Raise your hand for one. Raise your hands for two. <laughs> raise your hands for three. Uh, raise your hands for four. No intervention. Interventionists. In the room. Um, okay, so what I, one of the things I want to point out is that usually our, our sort of natural human instinct is to pick one, two, three, or four. When in fact, most of the literature that motivational interviewing is derived from suggests that we need to actually turn our instincts on our head, on, on its head, unless you're doing yoga, then you can be turned on your head, um, and actually listen to someone, someone's thoughts about you. Um, indeed, the research bears this out. So I, this might be a little bit fuzzy, but this is a review called Mesa Grande Review uh, 2002. So there's a lot of updates to it now. Showing, uh, and this table is beautiful, it gives a rank order of things that work to help people change uh, their addictions specific to alcoholism. Um, I want to point out, so first, brief intervention to motivational enhancement, largest effect sizes, um, lots and lots of different studies, and there's way more studies now um, up there. The top four, Brief interventions, motivationally based interventions, and I also want to point out our friend drugs are also up there. Um, surprising, right? But there are actually a lot of effective drugs to treat addiction. That's a separate lecture. Um, what's down here? Stuff that we normally do. Um, so this one, if you can't read it, confrontational counseling, uh, psychotherapy, so generalized treatment as usual, general alcoholism counseling. So confrontation, confronting people is better and alcoholism counseling. And down here are our bog standards, educational lectures, films, and groups. Teaching about people, teaching people about why their behavior is a problem, why they need to change, it just, it just doesn't work. Well, why is that? Some of the research suggests that there's some dynamic that happens between a health care provider, a mental health care provider, a physical health care provider, um, and their patients or clients that actually influences how the clients respond in session. And I'll show you, um, or at least I'll talk about some data later on that suggests that those in-session responses are strongly predictive of behavior. Okay, so this is a, a really cool study that Jerry Patterson did at the University of Oregon. And what he, uh, what he was interested in was how therapist behaviors related to the kinds of things that the clients said. And he was specifically interested in trying to figure out well, what are the things about the that the therapist might say that might be related to the patients uh, providing non-compliant responses, resisting, arguing, uh, ignoring, dismissing, all the things that we actually just saw Rachel do so fantastically when we provided her with our expert consensus on how to solve her problem. And uh, one of the things that they found in the correlational aspect of the research was then when uh, providers gave responses that were more like listening and uh, understanding, sort of non-judgmental stuff, uh, the non-compliant responses were really low. And whenever they were given responses that were something like teaching, confronting, or judging, got super high non-compliance. And what they decided to do was, okay, let's actually test this, test this experimentally. So they did an ABAB design, where they had therapists avoid all teach-confront responses for a certain period of time with the same client in a session, uh, something like five minutes or so. So this is our baseline. And then they had them go into teach-confront mode, and then they had them go back to baseline, and then back to teach-confront mode. And you see what happens to non-compliant responses, and this is per minute. So how, how often were you getting non-compliant responses from patients? When you're not avoiding teach confront, this isn't even being supportive or empathetic, this is just not being pushy. <laughs> when, you're, when you're pushy, it doubles. And when, you go, when it goes away, it almost goes back to baseline. And again, it almost doubles again when you're back to teach confront. So it points to some sort of dynamic interaction between healthcare providers and their patients or clients um, that is producing some kind of this resistance. And it actually, it, it led to Bill Miller's conceptualization of quote unquote resistance as not a character inherent to the person, which is sort of the psychodynamic Freudian idea that somebody doesn't change their addiction because they're in denial, they have resistance about it. They, what, what Bill Miller, and I think what this research supports um, conceptualizes, uh, quote, resistance as a product of an interaction between a pr uh, provider and their clients. So motivational interviewing was originated by Bill Miller, and it, it, he first started getting curious about this 
um, when he was doing a, a treatment of behavioral uh, approaches for alcohol treatment. And what he noticed, when he noticed the data, he was like, well, I wonder if we just coded how empathetic the therapists were um, and see if that does anything. And in fact, the empathy effect swamped all of the other effects uh, of the treatment. In fact, it explained up to two thirds of the variability in drinking at follow-up. In other words, the more empathetic the, the therapist was rated as, um, the less drinking their clients were doing. And he first developed this intervention called the Drinker's Checkup, which turned into motivational enhancement therapy, which is what a lot of people might be familiar with, which is essentially a structured form of MI that includes feedback. And then it sort of developed into this set of, uh, this sort of way of being, actually. I was going to call it a set of techniques, but it's not a technique called motivational interviewing. Um, so th if, you're, if you're familiar with MET, if you've heard of motivational enhancement therapy, it's essentially motivational interviewing that's uh, semi-structured and has feedback. Um, so you might say, if somebody might fill out a survey about their drinking, you'd say, okay, look, you're drinking at this you know, 78 percentile, what do you think about that? Um, defining motivational interviewing is easy. You can do it for you right here. So it's a person-centered guiding method of communication to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. That's what it is, one sentence. We've been, the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers has been debating and going back and forth as Bill and Steve Rolnick work on MI3, the third edition of the book. And this is what it was like a year and a half ago. It's still evolving. But one sentence, right? A person-centered guiding method of communication to elicit and strengthen motivation for change. Um, it's easy to define, but actually enacting it um, and really understanding the definition takes quite a bit of subtlety. And I want to um, show you a quick video, a quick segment of a video um, of motivational interviewing with horse. <laughs> it, I mean, it's not, so it's not quite, I actually don't know if we, do we have sound on this? Or not? Looks like we might not, but actually you don't even need uh, sound for this. I don't know if we do or not, but we'll. So this is Monty Roberts. He's um, the horse whisperer, is what uh, he's nicknamed. I'm pushing away. Oh, there you go. There's licking and chewing. So uh, this is about two minutes or three minutes in. This is a horse that has never had a saddle. And uh, Monty Roberts is uh, sort of famous for his ability to get horses to wear a saddle and have a rider in a very short period of time without any sort of punitive or uh, punishing uh, approaches, which is you know, sort of the, the reverse or opposite of a lot of ways that horses first get saddled. Um, so he's been uh, essentially having this horse sort of walk around uh, this thing. It's, it's about two minutes in. Very nice. Very nice. So, we predicted the ear. We predicted the head and the eye coming over, coming closer. <coughs> we made our prediction on the licking and chewing. And there's the bowing down. There's the bowing down. Very nice. Super good girl. That's so demonstrative right there. That's just as you see the Mustang do it. There's the licking and chewing again. Quite Is that a horse doing licking and chewing? <laughs> Very good conversation. Next round, I will go passive. Good licking and chewing. I will go passive the next round. Take my left shoulder by and then drop my eyes away from her eyes and reverse the hip. There we go. I'll get myself on a 45. 45 now. And invite her in. Very nice. Super good girl. There is the moment of growing up. You are good so I'll tell her how nice she is for coming in here. Invite her into my chest, standing right in front. Don't look her in the eye. I've already done that, and that means go away. Now I want her to be here with me, and she's finding value. And that's going up, and now I'll walk away and attempt to get follow-up. Wonderful. <coughs> Good follow up. I'll come around here now and try to make a left turn and have it come in. Right, so now it's just messing 
So that, you know, Monty Roberts, uh, Bill Miller was introduced to Monty Roberts, and as they were talking, uh, Bill learned about this technique for uh, saddling horses and uh, um, getting them ready to take riders. Uh, he was struck by the parallel to motivational interview. You can see with entirely with no physical contact, with only his presence, um, with uh, not pushing at the horse, um, but rather guiding the horse. You notice even when he's walking with the horse, the horse's nose is right here, right? He's not leading it, he's not pulling it along. He's not at the horse's other end, pushing it along. Um, he's just guiding. And this is one sense of what the spirit of motivational interviewing is all about. It's about joining, it's about guiding, um, it's about evoking some desire from within the client, within the individual. Um, we'll get back to that. So the first uh, thing you should know is this is the evidence-based practice lecture series. Uh, motivational interviewing works. And it works for a really broad range of changeable behaviors. One way to think about it is almost anything that an individual could actively choose to change about their lives. So if they have to have some control, some ability to change, um, <clears throat> they can change it. It started with addictions, but it spread over into uh, well, a broad, uh, it started with alcoholism, it spread into a broad array of uh, substance use uh, problems. Um, it spread into healthcare settings for a broad range of changeable uh, behaviors. And here's just a, a short list of things that it's commonly used for. Um, uh, there's over 200 uh, randomized clinical, uh, there's like 200 clinical trials, um, and some high proportion of those are RCTs, good randomized control trials. Um, you can see all of these things are things that, to some degree, the patient has some responsibility for changing. Now, this is, I want to take Alan Marlatt's point, and this is not to say that they have responsibility for getting to the point where they are uh, in the same way that they have responsibility for changing from where they are. Um, so, uh, one thing that, to point out, too, is that a lot of these, in fact, almost all of them, are things that might be relevant to children and adolescents. Um, you can have uh, for example, diabetes management for adolescents with uh, diabetes, dietary change, um, juvenile hypertension, obviously substance use, child mental health. We could also add in parenting. Motivational interviewing has been used to help engage people uh, in parenting programs and help keep them engaged uh, in parenting programs. So MI works, and it's worked for, and I, this sort of sounds a little sketchy when you say it, but it's worked for almost everything that people have looked at it. Uh, in part because when people look at it, they look for um, they, they look at behaviors that people can make some sort of conscious choice um, to make a change for. It's been extensively studied in adolescents. This is just a short list of studies. Um, it's not coming out well, but I just made this one big because it's number 77 on the list. And this is a list that I got off of the server about two years ago. Um, I haven't seen it updated. So there is a pile of studies that have sh demonstrated effectiveness across a broad range of behaviors in adolescents. Um, uh, there's less about MI with children in part because interacting with the children's cognitive resources uh, are different and so probably the best application of motivational interviewing uh, with children would probably be using MI with their parents. Um, you know, you can use some of the skills of motivational interviewing uh, with kids, but it's going to be, you know, somewhat less. Um, the interaction is going to be somewhat different because they have different uh, freedoms and abilities um, and cognitive resources. What, not only does MI work, but it works in what I think are some unexpected situations. Um, so the first one is, uh, MI works better with people who are ethnic minorities. A lot of times we think our treatments that we develop, you know, we develop them on these, you know, sort of white upper middle class, often, you know, college students or sort of the white upper middle class community. We don't know how it's going to work with people of different ethnicities, different socioeconomic status. Consistently, the meta-analyses suggest that motivational interviewing works better. Um, uh, with ethnic minor minorities than does with majorities. Um, interestingly, if you don't manualize the treatment, so if you, I, I couldn't quite find MI for dummies, but I thought that was close enough. Um, <laughs> if you don't manualize the treatment, uh, the effect of MI doubles. You don't have a manual. Now this is not saying non-adherent MI. The people who are doing MI without a manual are doing adherence MI, so that they're, they're, you can code their behaviors, they're doing everything you're supposed to do MI, but they're not following a manual. Doubles the effect. And, uh, and I'll talk a lot about change language or change talk, um, uh, uh, it, it's more effective when uh, the client is talking a lot more about changing towards the end of the session than they are, than when they are at the beginning. So it's like, well, how much they're, you know, so they come in telling you all they're ready to change, um, it's not as good of a predictor, but when uh, clients walk out talking about wanting to change, 
um, that's when uh, it seems to be especially effective, and that's one indicator that it's going to be effective. So it works in some, I think, relatively unexpected situations. Also, what, what I think is really amazing about MI, um, because if you, I haven't given you that sense of brief intervention. So you can do it in one session, two sessions, two sessions might even be pushing it. Um, you can do it in healthcare settings in as little as five minutes. Um, you can do it in 15, 20 minute sessions um, uh, of MI, and it works. It can work as a very brief intervention. And it, what's cool is that it works for a very long period of time. So here we see effect size is about 0.4, one to three months following a brief intervention, a couple of sessions usually for these studies, um, with the effect size declining. And I know you can't see this super well, um, but th there's a line here, this line C2, where the effect size 0.6 is pretty big, is maintained. Well, what is that? What's interesting is that when you combine motivational interview with other evidence-based treatments, the effect gets bigger and stays, it gets maintained. So what a lot of folks have done is to add motivational interviewing as an adjunct at, at sort of the beginning of therapy to increase engagement in their patients, which will increase the effect size and increase the <coughs> and, uh, maintain retention uh, over time. And this is from a 2005 meta-analysis of um, I think 77 RCTs. Okay, so MI works. I hope I've convinced you of that. It works for a lot of people, it works for a lot of behaviors, and it works better in certain circumstances. Often those are unexpected. Um, how does it work? I think the essence of MI is based in um, some of Daryl Ben's theory, is the idea that we are best convinced by our own reasons for changing or for doing anything. Um, in other words, we think motivational interviewing works because <clears throat> as a result of an MI session, people start talking themselves into changing. And, and the, the really the goal of the MI practitioner is to try to elicit that change talk from within the person. That's why we think it works. We have evidence that increased change talk in a session is related to client outcomes. We also have evidence that motivational interviewing uh, skill is related to um, client change talk. We don't quite have the data to put it all together yet, but folks are working on that. So this is, because I do like statistics, um, in my other life, this is a um, uh, sort of statistical life model. Um, so again, we think that MI works because it increases change talk, which in turn increases the client's inherent uh, commitment to changing. So you can have a lot of change talk, but if it doesn't turn into commitment, it's much less likely that uh, change is actually going to happen. So we think it works because first, therapists get trained in MI. They develop uh, higher levels of empathy and MI spirit. They also use lots of MI consistent methods, a lot of these sort of micro skills that I'll talk about in a minute. When they go into sessions with clients, they, they deploy those skills uh, in the spirit of um, MI spirit and empathy. You get a lot more client preparatory change talk and commitment language that in turn uh, increases the client's commitment to behavior change um, and results in behavior change. Um, and this comes from uh, a recent paper by Miller and Rose that was the American Psychologist article, all about MI. Um, what's really important here is that MI doesn't work when uh, therapists move towards planning change early. So I will say there, there actually have been studies. There was one major study that found it was an RCT, really well con conducted. Bill Miller was, the, was in charge of this RCT. It came out uh, in the early 2000s, in the early aughts. Um, and uh, they found that in this great uh, RCT, MI had no effect. None, zero. No difference from control. And so uh, at first they were kind of like, crap, what do we do? This is the best study we've done and our effects all disappeared. And then Paul Amrain uh, came along, who's a linguist, or still is, I hope. Um, and uh, he thought, you know, I wonder if there's something going on in these sessions. Because what they noticed is that about two thirds of the patients in their MI condition actually did show de uh, decreases in drinking over time. But there was this recalcitrant one-third um, that just refused to make any changes. And uh, they, what, what Paul Amrain did was actually code and do some analyses um, of the language, of people's what they were saying in sessions. And this is where that change talk at the end really comes into play. So it, uh, like I said, this was a big randomized control trial. There were lots of participants. Um, and most importantly, they had a manual. And that manual said at the end of your motivational enhancement session, you should move to change, planning change. Right? It didn't say, regard, it implied regardless of where your clients are. 
you should move to planning change. And so what they found was that for people who are not producing a lot of change talk uh, throughout the session, when they went to planning change, change talk went way down, sustained talk and resistance went way up, right? Because they moved to, to say, okay, how are we going to fix this problem when the client hadn't said, I would like to fix this problem. <laughs> the client was so sort of like, I don't know what to do. I don't know if I should change or not change. There's a lot of reasons why I should do both. Which, by the way, is how most of us feel when we're thinking about making a change. So what they could, this is where they sort of kicked off the let's look at change talk, because change talk is really important. And prematurely jumping to solutions when a client isn't giving the, the signal that they're ready is going to kill any, uh, any hope for change that, that you might have. OK, I want to um, try an exercise with you all. We're going to try to make it short. So um, I want everybody to do this. You're gonna, it's going to be loud, but we're going to do our best. So I want you um, to choose somebody next to you, or just a partner up to have a conversation with. Before you do that, before you start talking, hear me out, get the whole exercise, and then do this, OK? Uh, hopefully not your boss or supervisor, not somebody who. Um, and one of you is going to be the speaker, and one of you is going to be a counselor, OK? So why don't you go ahead and quickly pair up. Somebody next to you, you're going to have a conversation with this person. And then find your, find your partners, and then about changing what you haven't changed yet. In other words, something that you kind of feel two ways about. Now, again, this should be something that's appropriate to share. It, it, it would really be modern. It would be like, you know, I'm trying to buy a car and I can't decide between the CRV and the Subaru Outback. Um, you know, it really could be something, you know, you think about switching to political parties um, or something. Uh, you know, something, something that you're, you're free to share uh, or that you'd be willing to share in public. I mean, I'm not going to ask anybody what it is. You're not going to have to talk. Um, sorry. I tricked Rachel into doing that earlier, but well, I'm going to trick you again. Um, so, so, every, so whoever's the speaker? Does everybody know who the speaker is? Raise your hand if you're the speaker. Let's figure that out first. Okay. All right, so we have our speaker. Speakers, that's your job. Something that you would like to change. Everybody got something in mind? All right, now listeners, here's your job. Uh, or counselor. Let's call you the counselor. Better. So find out what the person, what change the person is thinking about making. That's your first job. Find out what they're thinking about making. And I'll leave this up because you have instructions. And then what I want you to do is to explain to them why they should make this change. <laughs> uh, I want you to give them at least three reasons. Come up with three reasons why they should make this change. Um, and, and benefits uh, that would result from making the change. Tell them how they can make this change. I don't need to make just three. Um, uh, emphasize how important it is for them to change. Uh, and, then, and persuade the person to do it. This is your job. I want you to try to try to utilize all of these techniques. I'll have I'll leave them up here uh, on the screen. And if you meet resistance, do it again. Okay, I'll give you I'll just give you a few minutes, like uh, five minutes to, to do this. So go ahead and have a conversation.
um, who talked the most? Was it the speaker or the uh, or the counselor? Raise your hand if counselor. 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 Right. Um, I, I mean, if anybody's willing to share, what was it like to be the speaker for you? What did it feel like? <coughs> well, you were, yeah, you were just listening. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have to do much or anything. I just kind of sat there and nodded. Yeah, it's actually kind of nice, isn't it? Yeah. What What else did it feel like? Yes. I was like, you don't know me. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh snap. Like, right. Yeah. And always for me, it always feels like I'm at my doctor's office. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, lecture. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did anybody start feeling sort of angry or frustrated? <laughs> Are people just not as reactive as I am? Right? Um, maybe you feel sort of, uh, yeah, and did people have that, like, you don't know who I am, you don't understand. You, did anybody argue? I, I, I didn't get angry or anything, but I felt like I came up with more excuses to not do it than oh, I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, your butt comes out, doesn't it? Uh, in other words, you start saying but, 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 but a lot. Your butt is all over the place. Um, what about being? What about being the counselor? What was it like for you being a counselor? You talked a lot. It was exhausting, right? It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah, right. You're at. You're. Well, speaking of butts, you're at the back end of that horse with that butt. You're just pushing it, right? And every once in a while, it's not just the butt you have to deal with. Yeah. I, you had to come up with something really creative right away. Oh, and yeah. Kind of keep talking so she so think of something. Yeah. Like Isn't that so much pressure? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure. You've got to outsmart your clients. <laughs> and we already showed, but we tried to outsmart, and then she had to hook up with Rachel, too, which is even worse. Fifty <laughs> of us cannot outsmart Rachel. Right? It's hard. Okay, now, unfortunately, we don't have time, but what I usually like to do is reverse this exercise. So what is MI? What, what, at least, what's some of the essence of MI? It would be asking the person why they think they might want to make this change or might should make this change. It might be asking them to imagine what benefits they would get if they would make that change. It might be, rather than telling them, asking them, well, what have you thought of about making this change? Um, Ask them, well, how might be important, how important it is, uh, how important is it for you to make this change? Sometimes the English fails me good. Um, <laughs> and it def could not be persuading the person to do it. You can flip this script on its head and get some of the essence of motivational interviewing. It turns everything back to the client, and it encourages and tries to evoke from them their own reasons and motivations for why they might want to make a change in behavior. And indeed, this is the, the spirit of motivational interviewing. It's centered in client-centered listening skills and empathy. And on top of that, we add, we add this is sort of the gas of motivational interviewing. There's, the research suggests that just having good MI spirit is unrelated to outcomes. We just had a vigorous debate on the MI listserv about this. But it is certainly something that fuels good MI practice. And what we're talking about is a spirit of collaboration. We're guiding, we're going, moving alongside our clients. We're evoking change talk and change from within. We're not trying to push it out of them or pull it out of them. We're trying to have it come from them. We're not giving them anything. All we're trying to do is provide an interaction, a dynamic, an environment where they feel free to start coming up with their own reasons about changing. And it's all about supporting autonomy. So if your client comes in and they want to quit smoking and you have lots of great ideas, who's going to be taking their Shantix every morning? Who's going to be having the nicotine patch stuck on them? Who's going to be smoking the replacement cigarettes? Not you. Who's going to keep the drink out of our alcoholic friends' hands? Who are, who's going to uh, sit with them during the Super Bowl and keep them occupied so that when they get that craving for that Budweiser um, with all that advertising, <coughs> Uh, who's going to make? Who's going to keep them from drinking? Are you going to strap them down? Are you going to follow them around every moment? No. So the spirit of MI recognizes that you have to have two experts in a room to have anybody change. One is the expert on behavior change or on some sort of specific topic, and the other is the expert on the patient. And conveniently, patients always bring that expertise with them. So the, we can think about motivational interviewing as having uh, a couple of stages. Uh, the first stage of motivational interviewing is client-centered. It's entirely client-centered. And what we, um, you can ignore the, the button at the bottom, but I just thought I'd pick a couple of some rowers. Because when you think about uh, motivational interviewing, it's sort of like rowing a boat. And the first thing you have to do to be able to move a boat, if you don't have a sail or some wind, you need some oars. 
And these are the, the basics of good client-centered skills. This is not specific to MI, uh, but it is the basis and the first part of these micro skills that you need. Um, so these orders, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening. Reflective listening really is, is actually the, the basis of MI. And reflective listening is really um, where uh, good client-centered skills come from. Uh, but it should be surrounded by these open-ended questions, affirmations, and summaries. We summarize what the client is telling us. So what do each of these look like? These are just some examples. Um, so we want a lot of open-ended questions because they keep the client talking. And when the client talks, we have material to work on. When the client talks, we don't have to work hard. We don't have to push to the back end of the horse. We don't have to come up with better solutions than they do. We keep them talking. It's usually good. So open-ended questions where we say, like, how does smoking play a role in your, uh, as a lead singer in a chorus? For example, how do you feel about smoking? Um, rather than, well, how many cigarettes did you smoke today? So especially um, uh, the uh, early, the psychologists who are early in their training, they get lots and lots of training and assessment and asking lists and lists of questions and creating checklists before their session about everything they want to accomplish when they go into that session. Uh, good MI practice is not about checklists. It's not about closing any questions. It's not about getting the information that you care about. It's about getting the information that's important to the client to talk about. Um, reflective listening. I think everybody here probably has at least some sense about good reflective listening. And reflective listening can be anything from a very simple mirror reflection where you literally repeat what the client says to you, to very complex reflections where you reflect multiple sides of a person's ambivalence, or you reflect cognitive meaning or emotion, or you even have strategic reflections where you might amplify the emotion that they're communicating to you or try to dampen it. Um, affirmations are key where we give, um, and affirmations are different uh, from cheerleading and rah, rah, rah. Uh, affirmation is sort of is, is this promoting and supporting efficacy uh, in clients. And then summary statements is sort of the final, final thing where you're sort of giving the person back a bouquet of all the things that they've said to them. We think about this actually as collecting a bouquet of statements. So a lot of times we think about collecting a bouquet of change talk, um, but I'll get to that in a minute. So summary statements and reflections are both ways of communicating to a client that you understand what's going on with them, that you hear what they're saying and, and you're communicating understanding. And these are very specific micro skills that you can enact um, in sessions to sort of pr produce this client-centered mindset. Um, the difference, though, between um, uh, MI uh, between MI and client-centered therapy is that you don't stop at your oars, right? Because if you just row a boat, it could go maybe in any direction, especially if the client is rowing with you. Um, well done MI doesn't look obvious, but it is directive. And I had a video clip that we don't have time uh, to show, um, uh, but it's just somebody, uh, it's just somebody, Bill Miller doing MI. Uh, <laughs> just some guy. Um, uh, and it, when you see MI in practice, it doesn't look obvious, it looks natural, it sounds and feels like a natural conversation, but the therapist is actually being quite strategic in what they do. Um, and th this is where the second phase comes in. So uh, remember I said it's a, um, it's a person-centered and guiding method of communication. So it's not all person-centered, it's not all non-directed, it is also, um, this, is a, this is an example of a darn cat. Um, it has nothing to do with motivational interviewing, so that's funny. Um, so darn cat, what is darn cat? The second phase of MI is trying to work towards the, using the reflections, the material that the client gives you, towards building discrepancy between where they currently are and where they see themselves, what they value, what they think is important to them, and where they would like to be. Um, and what you start looking for, once you get a good sense of the client's situation, what you start looking for are these darn cat statements. And these are, this is change talk, is the darn, and commitment language uh, is the cat. So we're looking for people saying things about their desire to make changes, their ability to make changes, reasons for changing, and their need to change. When you start getting that in sessions, a good MI practitioner will start reinforcing and attending to that change talk. Saying, oh, it's, you, you know, your, your drinking is really, uh, you really enjoy it on the weekends, and you're, you're also, though, starting to have problems at work because you're hungover for the first couple of hours every morning, and so you're late to work, and that's something that, you really, that really bothers you. And they did an example of uh, res responding to change talk. Somebody's sort of saying, look, I, I think I have to, this is really impacting my life. Question. Sorry, can you say what the acronym is for the change talk? Yes, sure. Desire, uh -huh. ability, reasons, 
and need. That's for change talk. For committed language, we're talking about commitment. Somebody's saying, this is something I think I'm going to do. This is something I might do. Um, we're, we're talking about, um, I forget what the A, I totally was going to remember what the A was and I forgot. Um, but we're talking about things like uh, moving towards taking steps and actually taking steps. Right, so people, so this might be somebody who's sort of investigating different things they could do, or they're saying, you know, next week, uh, you know, I, I'm, I made an appointment at the gym and I'm going to go do it, and then actually taking steps. So this is all, um, it starts with somebody saying, you know, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to cut back on my drinking. Uh, and then there's, thing, there's things along that sort of change spectrum that we look for. How do you get, so the first question was, how do you keep clients from pushing back at you? That's, what, that's when you use your orbs. How do you actually start getting change talk? How do you actually start steering the boat? Um, well, one of the things you can do is start asking evocative questions. You can, so like, you know, what would your life be like if you were, if you were, uh, if you were to change, make a change in your journey? Um, you can use change rulers, uh, and I don't have time to get into change rulers, unfortunately, but that's, sort of, that's uh, briefly, it's a thing where you say, well, how important is it to you to make a change um, in your diabetes management on a scale of zero to 10? And then they might say five. And the key to that is you, you say, well, I'm curious, how come you're a five and not a three? And what's the natural response about why you're why you're why you're higher than you might be? What do people usually give you? Hope. They give hope, right? Well, I mean, I'm a, it's important to me to change my diabetes because my toes are starting to get a little bit numb, and that really scares me, right? So it's really important to me. It's more important than, to me than to make this change. What would happen if you queried high? If somebody said, "Yeah, I'm a five, you know, it's a five about how important it is for me to get better at managing my diabetes," they're really a five. How come you're not a ten? What are they going to tell you? Discouragement, right? They're going to tell you all the reasons why they can't make that change. So you use these things strategically to try to evoke commitment language and change talk and try to essentially ignore or downplay, not downplay actively, but sort of you attend to less the sustained talk. So there's lots of different things that you can do. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm just giving you the names of these things because they really, it takes training and practice and exercise and feedback to really get this. Um, so there's lots of different techniques that you can use to get that. And when you get change talk, you want to use your ears. You want to let your ears perk up. My dogs, by the way, are disappointed that they did not get to be in this picture. <laughs> Some of them especially have big ears. Um, uh, you want to use your ears when you hear change talk. You want to elaborate, ask the person to elaborate on the change talk. You want to affirm the change talk. You want to reflect the change talk. And towards the end, when you feel like you're sort of getting it together and you've got a whole sense, you want to give them a bouquet of all the change talk and give it back to them in a form of a summary. You collect all of the reasons why they're talking about making a change and you give it back to them. So, it, you know, hopefully you're getting some sort of a, a little bit of a sense about what motivational interviewing and the skills of MI might look like in practice. Again, I want to warn you that um, nobody's going to be able to walk out of here if you've had no exposure and actually do something that looks like MI. Um, uh, and that's sort of the next thing I want to talk about in my last couple of minutes um, here is that learning MI is a long road. It takes time, training, and practice with feedback. And this is maybe the most important thing to understand is if you can't take a workshop in motivational interviewing, and I'm not saying this because it's so hard and it's so special, but we have research that shows that people, when people go to a one-day or two-day workshop, for example, in motivational interviewing, they leave all excited, um, saying they're yes, and using MI in their practice until you look at their video and audio tape. You listen to their audio tapes, look at their video tapes. And what happens? No changes, or almost no changes, right? Um, they, so they, they learn about MI in these workshops, but unless you actually have somebody watching your in-session behaviors and help, helping guide you towards effective use of your oars, your darn cat, and your ears, people don't generally make changes, or they don't generally make effective changes. That's what our research suggests, and it's not really unique to MI. Most of our workshops on therapy are not really pretty changing people. Um, uh, so you can get lots of CE credits, but it may not actually change your practice. Um, so what are the stages of learning MI? This is a, a great paper by Bill uh, Miller and Terry Boyers. Um, if we're both at the University of New Mexico. What do you first have to get? Well, first you just have to get a sense of the spirit, this collaborative, <coughs> uh, evocative, autonomy-supporting spirit of MI. Then people need to learn and practice their basic oars. They need to practice rowing, get feedback on their rowing, um, get feedback on their oars. And then they need to be able to recognize change talk. You just got to be able to recognize it first. You just got to be able to understand and identify what, what does it sound like when you have a dark cat in the room. Um, and then people need to be able to respond. They need to be able to use their ears and elicit 
learn how to both elicit change talk and reinforce and respond to change talk. Um, we also, as change talk comes up, as people start thinking about making a change, usually because they're ambivalent, um, because most of us, if we weren't ambivalent, we would have already changed, um, we start thinking of reasons why we're not going to change. So sustained talk also starts coming up, the opposite of change talk. All the desirability reasons and need for them not to change. And you have to learn how to roll with that resistance. Not push against it, but roll with it and get them, acknowledge it, uh, 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 reflect it, and get them back on track um, so that they're just making their own decision. Um, developing a change plan is the next phase that you have to learn how to do. And then consolidating their commitments so that when they leave, they're really ready to go with that change plan. And then finally, once you've sort of mastered all of that NMI, then you can learn how to integrate it with other treatment methods. Um, and so I think I'm going to stop here. I have uh, one more slide that I want to show you, um, but I just want to take questions actually and just give you a, give you a whole bunch of myths um, about what MI is and isn't. But I want to stop because uh, I think we just have a few minutes left and take questions that you might have about MI, uh, especially maybe with children and adolescents, but or generally MI in general. Right, yeah. This study um, populations of people Good question. Has it been studied with people with intellectual disabilities? I'm not as familiar with that research. That's one thing I might, one, one of my worries, of the, of the things about where MI might be limited, because you need people to be able to think about what's important to them, to be able to have the cognitive resources to, to sort of make some sort of consistent change. So there might, so somebody with cognitive difficulties, like, you know, maybe brain, you know, cognitive damage, um, uh, it, there might be some difficulties in implementing MI with folks like that. Although I will say, it, as I say that, it does come to mind that I have seen at least one study showing some effectiveness of uh, MI for people with head injury. Um, but there, you know, some sort of cognitive limitation might might be an issue. But you know, I don't know how low your IQ has to be before you can't uh, talk about what's important to you and follow through with that. So I, I, I would sort of be, I, I think for most intellectual difficulties, it would probably be effective. But that's speculation, yeah. No, not that I'm aware of, yeah. How do you determine um, Right, that's a good question. Well, I mean, so I think generally with adolescents, you're going to be fine. I think 10 and up, just a, a broad rule that, that they're going to be fine. You know, between 10 and 12, they start, they really, you know, kids really gain the ability um, to sort of make to have a lot more independence and more volition and make more changes on their own. Um, younger, and, and part of the reason the younger than that, kids have a lot less control over their lives. Um, a lot of the interventions, the evidence-based interventions we're doing with kids, we're not actually doing with necessarily the kids themselves, it's mostly with the parents. Um, so you're thinking like, uh, you know, behaviorally, you know, behaviorally dysregulated eight-year-old, um, maybe with ADHD. That is, MI is not really going to work, but it's going to work with parents to engage them in a parent training program that's going to help them structure. You know, so you want to sort of think about what's the natural treatment we do for kids, what's the evidence base for kids' um, treatment, and depending on what the evidence base says, you sort of go, you would follow that. Does that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I'll say, you know, I'm not, um, I know it works with adolescents, um, which I would say would be as young as 10, I just don't know the literature as much on children. But I would suspect that most ways it's going to be implemented with kids would actually be with their parents for parent and family based interventions. Um, I'm going to try and remember everything you said earlier. Yeah, I know. I think um, we'll do a video so we can <laughs> slow it down to half speed and okay. follow everything I'm saying. Um, you said that um, client change talk at the beginning of the session is not necessarily predictive yeah. of positive change in behavior mm -hmm. later on, um, but if they're saying by the end of the yes. session. So if you're having these short 15 minute sessions or one session, mm -hmm. how can you detect that change? You mean if they're, um, you mean, uh, well, I mean, they, like what they've done is minute by minute coding of change talk. Like that, that's how the research has worked. So they look, people might come in with a lot of change talk, but it really, what really matters is what they're doing at the end. And it, I mean, so if you could do 15 minutes, you'd have 15 intervals. Even if they're not, because I, don't, I, I wonder if every client is going to feel like they're saying something different just in five minutes. Um, it's, it's, I know, it's surprising, but you can have very brief interactions with people and really, the, the, the idea is that people change for really good reasons. And that that people who are ready to change, um, uh, change because those reasons become very apparent and the sort of need and desire and all of that stuff becomes really important to them. We sort of reconnect people with values. Um, there's a lot There's a lot of pain in between not being, when, when you sort of recognize where you are and how far away you are from where you like to be. And that, in my sense, I don't have any research on this, but my sense is it's that emotional 
uh, difficulty that's, that's motivating you, you can get it done very quickly if you re are really effective with your analytics skills. It doesn't always work. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's really, yeah, it's, I mean it's really, you know, and, and it, it also depends. Like for the five minute interventions, you're going to get a lot less change talk, a lot less, you know, to be more like a quick healthcare sort of open ended kind of thing. Yeah, really, really good question. Yeah. Um, if workshops and learning MI through um, talks and books and stuff isn't helpful, how do you recommend the practitioner? Great question. Um, so, so you start with workshops and books. Those, that's the starting point. The thing is, so I guess I don't need to be so dismissive. That's not enough. So the, the recommendation is that you find uh, an MI practitioner, an MI trainer, to actually do um, supervision for you. And preferably to actually do coding of uh, audio tapes or video tapes of your session. Because um, what the, really the way that you learn MI is having somebody uh, give you feedback on every moment, every utterance that you provide in response to clients and what clients say. And sort of say, okay, here's what you said, and notice what the client says in response to that. Here's how you might do it in an MI consistent way. Um, even just notice uh, coding people, uh, their open-ended versus closed-ended questions in a session, number of reflections, uh, number of reflections, two questions, even just doing numbers actually helps people improve uh, if, you, if you're going for, if you know what your goal is. So yeah, so, so really what you want is coaching and feedback. And you can get that through audio and video tape. People do coaching over Skype, they do internet coaching, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I think we're out of time, but thank you so much for your time. Contact me if you have any follow-up questions, email.